It says this yes, meeting it, is being recorded. Okay. So I will start. So welcome to the November edition of the ILE Forum 2024. Uh, the title of the forum today is Normative Linguistics, 25 years on. We have three guest speakers today, Ingrid Tiekenbohm van Ostade from Leiden University, Morana Lukacs from the University of Groningen, and Linda Pilier from Ex Marseille Université. Uh, they are all specialists in the field of normative linguistics. So after listening to their short presentations, we can exchange our opinions on normative grammars, prescriptive grammars, and various related topics. Now I would like to introduce our first speaker, Ingrid. Ingrid Tickenbaum van Ostade is Professor Emeritus at Leiden University. She has published widely on late modern English, and is particularly interested in the final stages of the English standardization process, process, codification and prescription. Her most recent monograph is entitled Describing Prescriptivism, Usage Guides and Usage Problems in British and American English, which was published in 2020. So Ingrid. Thank you, uh, Yoko. Um, I'll share uh, start sharing my screen and then um, get my uh, PowerPoint going. Yeah, it's good. Is it? Yes, yeah, it's working. Okay, so um, this is uh, uh, what it's supposed to uh, look like in um, presentation mode. Um, I'd like to start by um, thank, thanking Yoko for the invitation. I'm really, really pleased uh, about this, uh, Yoko, um, for its own sake, but also because I realized in preparing this um, brief talk that we've known each other for 30 years this year. Uh, you came to Leiden in 1994 for a conference on negation. Do you remember? And it's so nice to be in, uh, in touch uh, again. I'm also very pleased um, that my two um, fellow contributors, Morena Lukac and Linda Pilier, agreed to uh, be here today with me. And uh, as you'll see, um, they have um, very interesting um, um, talks to um, add to uh, what I'm going to say. Um, uh, my, my own talk will be an overview of what um, has been going on for uh, um, the past since um, the start of the ILE um, organization, because um, when um, Yoko contacted me about this, I thought back of the very first ILE meeting. This was in Freiburg in 2008, where um, the purpose of the meeting was to found uh, the International Society for the Linguistics of English. Um, which is um, what ILE stands for, and it's been active uh, ever since. But when they um, sent out a call for papers, they, uh, their, their topic was setting the agenda. And I thought I'm going to grab this opportunity to try and put normative linguistics um, on the agenda. Um, so I put out a call for um, a, a workshop, um, and I'll show you uh, the contributors in the next slide. But the reason for doing so at the time was that I was in the midst of a big research, big funded research project called the Codifiers and the English Language, uh, which ran from 2005 to 2010. The point about this project was to show that the 18th century grammarians were not prescriptivists as they uh, were usually taken, for example, in uh, uh, Jean Aitchison's book, Language Change, Progress or Decay. Um, this is, was at the time was a very standard uh, perspective on the grammarians, but what I wanted to, to show was that the grammarians had to be um, viewed and interpreted in the context in which they lived, and um, that prescriptivism was not, some, not their main concern at the time. So I also wanted to show in this project that the 18th century was not the age of prescriptivism, but um, I think actually that the age of prescriptivism is more, more um, fitting, uh, a more fitting term for what happened afterwards. Um, oh. There are a lot of cliches that uh, um, um, were present at the time and that I've meanwhile 
found there hard to kill. So, for example, that Bishop Louth wrote a grammar, and I've even come across one reference to Archbishop Louth, who wrote a grammar. He was never an archbishop, and he didn't write his grammar as a bishop. He wrote it for his son to learn English grammar before he went to school. So Louth, the prescriptivist, is um, an uh, idea about Louth that um, still pers persists, and also the idea of the long 18th century. These are, uh, I find, cliches that um, are still around. And perhaps with this, um, this talk, um, this uh, presentation, um, it'll help to, uh, to put them into um, a wider perspective. Um, now for the workshop, I had an enormous uh, enthusiasm for the call for the a workshop on normative linguistics. Um, and here are the participants. Anita Auer, who was a postdoc in my project at the time, Joan Beal, Charlotte Brewer, Kate Barridge, Ulrich Busse, and Anne Schroeder from uh, uh, Halle, from Halle uh, Wittenberg, David Crystal, Victoria Gonzalez Diaz, Jenny McManus, uh, Jeff Pullum, Nuria Yanez Butha, and uh, of course uh, myself. Now, the names that are um, uh, printed in bold here are the um, uh, is, is a reference to uh, the publications of their contributions in English today, and that's something that. Um, uh, was a direct result of uh, organizing the workshop and that is that English today from then on has been has become uh, a peer-reviewed uh, journal so that's something that um, came out of uh, presenting the papers as for a special issue. Uh, David Crystal did not actually publish with, uh, publish with us because um, his contribution was published at the in as the introduction to um, the uh, reprint, modern reprint of Fowler's Modern English Usage. Um, I'm um, about to move house, um, again, some of you uh, will say, um, but um, this not, not, not until uh, uh, the next few months, but it gives me the opportunity of clearing uh, up uh, old stuff. And I came across my uh, presentation for the, um, uh, the first aisle meeting. And as you can see there, uh, what I mentioned is a yawning gap. That's perhaps um, overdoing a little bit, but that's how I felt about it at the time. And I wanted to put um, normative linguistics on the agenda. What I also found was three of the papers that uh, were not uh, actually published and that are now uh, um, uh, commemorate uh, uh, as having been really good and interesting papers. You can see my uh, comments on... Uh, <laughs> on the uh, images. They're from Anita Auer, uh, Victorina Gonzalez Diaz, Nuria Yanez Butha, and Jennifer McManus. They may have been published elsewhere, uh, but they were a really interesting uh, contribution to the workshop at the time. So what I want to do today, and what I am doing already, is looking back to when uh, I'll began and when normative, where I tried to put normative linguistics on the agenda, and uh, looking forward, and that is what the other two presentations will be doing in particular. So normative linguistics, what is this term, uh, what is this term supposed to uh, mean? What I wanted to show was that normative linguistics is more than descriptivism compared to or were set against um, descriptivism. Um, this has become a uh, a widely challenged uh, perspective now um, in recent years. So that's good. Um, for example, in this uh, introduction by um, Don Chapman and um, uh, Jacob Rawlins, where uh, they uh, describe how this how the um, the perspective is much more complicated and less just this um, Klein or whatever uh, people tend to see it as. Now, in my um, own work, I've always relied on Emma Vorlat's paper from 1979 already, who um, sees a tripartite, um, uh, presents a tripartite prescription, a description of what she sees is going on. Uh, and she looks at uh, normative uh, approaches to language, which she defines as follows, a normative grammar being still based like descriptive grammar on language use, uh, but favoring the language of one or more social or regional groups and more than once written with a pedagogic pedagogical purpose. Now, from my perspective, this beautifully fitted in with the um, 
uh, with what the 18th century grammarians were doing. So I looked at them from a normative rather than um, prescriptive perspective, and I was able to show that they could also at, at times be uh, descriptive in their work. Now, the term normative is also part of the title of DENG, the Dictionary of English Normative Grammar by Sun Bi et al, 1991, um, which is a wonderful, wonderful inventory of proscriptive meta-language in all uh, uh, linguistic publications from as far as they could have their hands on them from the 18th century. They don't um, actually define a normative, as I have confirmed by uh, Tertu Neverlinen the other day, who wrote a really informative um, uh, review of what uh, uh, Deng uh, was doing. And in my own later work, I discovered that you can use Deng and the, uh, the proscriptive meta-language that they uh, classify also for um, uh, modern views of prescriptive uh, approaches to language. Uh, as uh, Yoko said, my interest is in codification and prescription, and I see these as the final stages in the standardization process. That is to say, how standardization, how standardization is described by uh, James and Leslie Milroy in their book uh, from 1985. It works really well uh, for English. At the same time, it's based on Haugen's uh, model, 1996. Uh, at the same time, I found that um, uh, Haugen's model persists and may be misinterpreted by uh, scholars taking these, um, what, he, what he regarded as not as stages, but as aspects of language development, um, as stages, which I don't think they are. This is a grid uh, that shows how languages may be may uh, develop into from a uh, dialect into uh, standard language, which was his purpose. For my own use, I've drawn on these seven stages by the Milroy selection, acceptance, diffusion, maintenance, elaboration of function, and then finally prescription um, and codification. Because I found that um, these stages work really well when looking at the history of the English language. So this is my, has been my um, perspective on um, the uh, field. So Lauth, not a prescriptivist, um, he should be viewed in the context of uh, what 18 grammarians were doing. What he does stand out for is his um, ideas, uh, which were based on his reading of um, the critical and monthly reviews at the time. And Carol Percy has played a major role in major role in um, in explaining what was going on at the time during the um, 1750s. Um, in general, people were concerned with correct language use, and they put that into um, the reviews of uh, books that they had been writing. Um, so this is something we see reflected in his footnotes and not in his major grammar, in his grammar uh, itself, which uh, um, is tends to be uh, uh, descriptive and with a little overlay of um, um, prescriptive views on the language. Um, when uh, he was widely plagiarized, and Linky Murray uh, is a good example of that, and he actually uh, copied Laos, some of Lao's rules and made them much more prescriptive. So we get to a much more prescriptive outlook on uh, the English, uh, on the English language and English grammar towards the end of the 18th century, 1795. Um, codification, as I've also found in my uh, own work, leads to an interest in prescription and prescriptivism. And uh, the first um, uh, uh, usage guide um, that is properly uh, prescriptive is uh, Robert Baker, 1770, who was influenced by uh, the French Academy and thought he could do something similar for the English language. There are great similarities with what Louth was doing. And for his second edition, he, ma he made sure to say that I didn't plagiarize. I don't think he did either, but he read the same review literature that uh, Louth had read before him. So in my book, describing prescriptivism, what I wanted to do was to show how uh, prescriptivism arose out of the codification of the language. And uh, in this second major uh, project, which I had, Bridging the Unbridgeable Linguists, Prescriptivists and the General Public, uh, which ran from 2011 to 2016, and in which Mor Morina played a major part. 
I wanted to show that um, prescriptivism came to uh, have an established uh, position as a next stage in the standardization process. Within this project, we developed the huge database of usage guides and usage problems, um, which has been very useful for our project and has been used by other people as well. It's freely available. If you let me know, I'll, I'll give you access to it. Um, what I was really surprised by in all this was that usage problems in the English language have never been systematically um, made an inventory of, unlike for Dutch. So there's this book, uh, but this is how I learned it at school by uh, Wouter van Wingerden, who did a survey among 17,000 um, informants and uh, described, made a selection of usage problems for his book um, and gave a very descriptive, informative, social linguistic, he's not a, a social linguist, but that's his approach, uh, of usage, both for uh, Dutch used in the Netherlands and in Flanders. Uh, usage guides are a major part of the huge database. Um, prescriptivism sells. The question is why that is the case. And I think by uh, looking at the different usage guides in the huge database, we've got a better idea of uh, why this is um, the case, a better um, idea of the text type uh, as such. So since 2008, um, what has been um, uh, the result of these two major projects? Uh, <laughs> for this presentation, I tried to make a, a tally of uh, all the results. What I uh, just want to focus on particularly is um, the English Today column we uh, had for uh, uh, a number of years. Thanks to Morana, this was Morana's uh, idea and it allowed us to, uh, to ask for um, uh, the reading readers of English Today for their input, and uh, uh, their input has been really uh, of great interest. So we were interested in outreach, uh, in involving um, the general public, part of the uh, title of the uh, of the uh, project, by having uh, blogs, by carrying out surveys, by um, by getting in touch with the scholarly community, which for my own personal development was very important. I mentioned the huge database, which is an uh, important uh, uh, project. Um, and what I think, I can't link this directly, obviously, to uh, what we've been doing, but thanks to big projects like this, there's been an enormous output. And what we see is that there, in conferences, there is a greater awareness of the subject. And I was really pleased to see um, the uh, publication of the um, uh, in, uh, um, ICHL, um, conference that was held in Leiden, which had prescriptivism in its subtitle. So that's really uh, of interest. And then uh, taking going back to um, the opening conference uh, where Elizabeth Traugott, um, uh, um said about Isle um, and the status quo for English at the time was that basically all, I think that's if I remember correctly, all subfields of English linguistics started with English. I can't remember her being challenged with that, um, but what I uh, would like to say more, and I will go into this uh, a little bit further, is the recent publication of the Routledge Handbook, which allows us to um, start uh, co comparing um, English, what has going, been going on in English with other languages. So my final slide, uh, uh, in the subtitle, 25 years on, I'm, very, I'm not very good at uh, making predictions, but what I do think is that we have really good new tools and we have really good data in huge um, ESEG, uh, a database of uh, 18th century uh, English grammars, ESEP on um, 18th century English pronunciation. We have these huge corpora uh, online. Uh, we have handbooks and databases and at... Um, the um, most recent prescriptive conference that um, Linda hosted, uh, there was one very interesting talk about um, uh, starting a database of style guides, which is a different uh, a text type from usage guides, so kind of huge 2.0, which I'm really looking forward to. I'm interested in um, hearing from uh, the input from the audience or the people that are there, uh, what kind of new approaches they uh, see coming up. But what I want to stress is that we shouldn't discard the old resources. We should 
uh, continue making use of them, but we should look at them in the historical context in which they are written. So I regularly see uh, uh, Leonard's essay, Leonard 1929, being referred to as Leonard 1962, which of course um, is uh, an, uh, it puts them into a different linguistic context. So um, here in my references, what I would like to promote is that even in in-text references, Aitchison is referred to as 1981-2013, Leonard is 1929-1962, and Milroy Milroy is 1985-2012. So that's, uh, if I can give a take-home message from uh, my talk uh, now, is that I would like to advocate is that we uh, we see earlier publications which are still very valid and very useful in their um, particular um, so social historical linguistic contexts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ingrid. Um, I think we listen to the three papers first before asking questions. Perhaps people have uh, questions, but maybe I introduce the second speaker and then we listen to the papers. Uh, the second, uh, yes, the second uh, speaker is Morana. Morana Lukacs is an assistant professor at the University of Groningen. Her research focuses on grassroots prescriptivism and how speakers enact standard uh, language ideologies, as well as on gender inclusive language change in both English and Dutch. She recently co-edited the Routledge Handbook of Linguistic Prescriptivism, uh, which was published in 2023. So Morana, please. Uh, hi, good morning again, and uh, many thanks to Isle for the invitation and to Yoko also for moderating and making sure everything runs smoothly. Um, I'll just see whether the sharing works. Can you see my screen? Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right, so um, I'll just begin briefly by introducing myself, uh, contextualizing my work um, within the field of normative linguistics and highlighting some um, relevant areas in the field. Um, and finally discussing, like Ingrid did, what I see are potential future developments. Um, so as you've heard, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Groningen in the Department of European uh, Languages and Cultures in the Netherlands. And my research since my doctoral thesis can broadly be situated within the field of normative linguistics. Uh, my journey in this field began in 2012 when I joined the Bridging the Unbridgeable project led by Ingrid. And within this project, my particular focus was on analyzing linguistic complaints voiced by members of the general public. And this research trajectory has continued to shape my work um, ever since. So for today's talk, um, I'd like to focus on several key points uh, that have been central to my work in normative linguistics. So the first of these themes is directionality. Uh, traditionally, language norms have been primarily understood as disseminated in a top-down fashion from institutions and authorities. However, I've devoted much of my research to exploring grassroots or bottom-up prescriptive efforts, particularly how language users enact these norms in everyday interactions. The second point um, I'll touch upon is data use for analysis in the field. Um, so it's been rather common uh, to rely on prescriptive literature, corpus data, attitudinal surveys as data points. Uh, but my research has also made extensive use of social media and that of others today as well. So these platforms offer a unique opportunity to observe how norms are enacted in real time and in naturalistic everyday contexts. So the third uh, theme I want to address uh, is the relationship between uh, changing language norms and evolving social norms. So this phenomenon demonstrates that linguistic norms aren't always about enforcing established standards, but also about advocating for new ones. So fourth, I'll briefly touch on the methods we've employed in the field and the potential for incorporating new ones, such as experimental approaches. This is an exciting area with a lot of promise for future research. 
And finally, I want to highlight ongoing efforts to broaden our understanding of normative linguistics, particularly beyond the Anglophone and a select few uh, standard European linguistic contexts. So first, let's take a closer look at the concept of directionality. So as I've already mentioned, prescriptivism is commonly viewed as a top-down process. Norms are often disseminated indeed by institutions and language experts, essentially groups that hold linguistic authority or in Bourdieu's terms, um, linguistic capital within a specific speech community. These top-down top structures have been extensively studied and hold a central place in linguistic research as these groups are the decision makers responsible for language policies, curricular changes, editorial standards that shape published content. In the past decade, however, there has been an increased focus on prescriptive efforts that work in a counter-directional manner. The term grassroots prescriptivism, introduced by Theresa Haidt in 2014, describes initiatives organized in a manner similar to grassroots polit uh, political actions. Unlike traditional prescriptivism led by influential elites, grassroots prescriptivism is driven by self-organized communities, often online, but also through participatory media, um, such as radio call-ins or letters to editors in newspapers. These efforts reveal that norms can be communal and participatory, especially within emerging communities where language norms are still evolving. The need for studying for grassroots communities is best evidenced by the number of publications and researchers that have adopted the term since 2014 in their writing, which is at the moment almost, moment almost 100. So in my work on bottom-up normative and prescriptive efforts, I've largely focused on data gathered from digital spaces. Online spaces have provided a robust framework for metalinguistic debates. In pre-social media times, people could express concerns about language use or perceive declines in language standards through media like radio or newspapers, but these platforms were limited in their reach. Today, online platforms facilitate public discussions that are readily accessible to linguists, allowing us to observe not only metalinguistic debates, but also norm negotiation in real time especially around issues that remain unsettled or fluid. In a case study I conducted with Teresa Hyde, we examined the neg negotiation of pronunciation norms for terminology used in online contexts. We found that platforms like Reddit give rise to new authorities. But who are these authorities? In our study, we found that those who often assert the correct pronunciations of terms like imger or imager, gif or jif, tend to be the so-called ideal speakers, individuals knowledgeable about orthographic conventions and tech-savvy users fluent in the digital and programming influence register. In another study with Suzanne Reichelt, we explore the question of who establishes norms around gender-related language in online spaces. We discovered that content creators exert significant influence, but the communities that follow them also play a crucial role in maintaining or reshaping language norms. This demonstrates how social media can foster inclusivity and encourage participatory engagement in language use. However, these spaces also reflect broader societal tensions. While online environments support gender inclusive language, they also provide a platform for opposition, mirroring the divisiveness present in wider society. This brings me to my next point, language norms and their changes reflect larger societal changes and shifts in attitudes of speakers. Uh, linguistic attitudes don't exist in isolation. They are intertwined with our social attitudes and personal beliefs. This is particularly evident in cases of normative language practices, which Anne Curzon classifies as politically responsive prescriptivism. A prime example highlighted by Curzon in her book, Fixing English, is the shift in gender's language norms. Initially focused on replacing generic masculine forms, this area now encourages thinking beyond binary gender concepts. These shifts often begin with communities with specific stakes in the issue and later spread to others with similar values, even signaling individuals' political beliefs. Early cross-linguistic research I conducted with Evan Bradley suggests that these values can transcend languages. Multilingual speakers who adopt gender inclusive language in one language often introduce or question gender language in the, their other languages as well. 
Traditionally, studies on language norms have focused on historical analysis of prescriptive literature, such as grammars, usage guides, and sign language. Such texts are frequently studied alongside language use in corpora. Synchronous studies have also utilized attitudinal surveys and examined language ideologies as expressed in the public sphere. Recently, I've argued for adopting experimental approaches to investigate the effect of prescriptive advice on language use. In a recent study, I posed the question, can prescriptive pronouncements affect attitudes toward linguistic features, especially regarding non-binary pronouns in Dutch? Preliminary findings suggest that they can, and the phrasing of such guidelines also plays a role. I'd be happy to discuss this in more detail if there's interest afterwards. Another area I'd like to highlight is the emerging research beyond Anglophone linguistics. Like many fields, normative linguistics has traditionally focused on English and a select few European languages. Recently, however, we've seen a diversification of languages studied within this paradigm. The publication of the Routledge Handbook of Linguistic Pre Prescriptivism in 2023 marks a significant step in this direction. Together with my co-editors, Joan Beale and Robin Stryer, we advocated for inclusivity by inviting contributors uh, from scholars working on languages often underrepresented in research, including Arabic, Hebrew, Russian, Croatian, Breton, Chinese, and the official languages of South Africa. This approach aims to create a more nuanced picture of linguistic norms and illustrates how they can, may be universal, yet manifest uniquely in different social and cultural contexts. As we look ahead to 2033, when the field of normative linguistics celebrates its 25th anniversary, we can begin to consider developments that lie on the horizon. Grassroots efforts will likely remain influential, particularly in digital spaces. We can anticipate further growth in global perspectives and an expansion in the range of languages studied in normative linguistics. While more researchers investigating language norms, um, methods, both experimental and beyond, are expected to diversify. There will likely be increased focus on politically responsive prescriptivism, including the backlash it may provoke, and on the intersections between language norms and social justice, as seen in movements for language reform or in discussions about language use in education. Finally, with a prominent role of AI and large language models in text production and editing, we can expect uh, a rise in studies examining the impact and appropriate role of AI in shaping language norms. Okay, thank you for your attention. Looking forward to the discussion afterwards. Thank you very much, Morana. So now I would like to introduce the third speaker, Linda. Linda Pillier is professor at Ex Marseille University. She has published extensively on the prescriptive role of copy editors in works of fiction, notably in the intralingual translation of British English texts for the American reader. Her monograph, Intralingual Translation of British Novels, a stylistic multimodal perspective, was published by Bloomsbury in 2021, and she has co-edited several volumes, including Standardizing English, Norms and Margins in the History of the English Language, which was published by Cambridge University Press in 2018, and the Routledge Handbook of Intralingual Translation, which was published in 2024. Now, Linda, please. Thank you very much, Shoko, for that introduction. Thank you for organizing this and for Ingrid as well. It's been great to, to join with you in this. Um, so I'll try and share my screen. Hopefully that's visible for everyone. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. So I'm just going to begin by saying a few words of introduction because I didn't come to prescriptivism or normative linguistics through the study of historical linguistics. I am in fact, originally a stylistician. Uh, my thesis, which is more years ago than I'd like to admit, uh, was a linguistic analysis of Virginia Woolf's style. Um, it all came about really through a mistaken double order via a well-known e-commerce platform. Um, I mistakenly ordered the surgeon of Crowthorn and the professor and the madman thinking I had ordered two totally different books. Um, it was only when I opened the first pages that I realized I had in fact the US and the UK edition. 
up until then, I hadn't really paid attention to this phenomenon. I hadn't really realized that, in fact, um, the US re-edited books for their market. Um, and beyond the changes to the spelling and the lexicon, which are immediately obvious, um, what struck me was that other changes had been made that I wouldn't have realized, they wouldn't have been visible, in fact, had I not the two editions in front of me. Now, having followed enunciative linguistics in France, I was very much of the mind that if a speaker chooses a specific structure, it's with a specific intention. In other words, changes to the grammatical structures, therefore, would introduce changes in meaning. So removing, for example, the passive voice or the use of existential there, that is, there is, there are, would, from the standpoint of enunciative linguistics, change the meaning. So the study of these changes led me to explore the concept of intralingual translation, a term first introduced by Jakobsen, and which he defines as rewording or an interpretation of verbal signs by means of other signs of the same language. Uh, with a corpus of some 80 works of various works, children's fiction, biographies, novels, and so on, um, I was able to then write a monograph on the topic, as Yoko said, and I recently co-edited the Routledge Handbook of Prescriptive uh, Intralingual Translation uh, with a Turkish colleague, uh, Ozembek Albaktun. I was aware that the changes, though, that I'd noticed could not simply be placed under the term Americanizing the text. Um, so I came across examples, uh, which you'll probably recognize if any of uh, in your publications yourselves, where the restrictive uh, relative clause, the use of which um, had been replaced by that systematically in some works. Now, these changes could not really be labeled Americanization. Um, when I started reading about what Americans were saying about this phenomenon, a lot of them were denying uh, that it should actually uh, happen. So these changes were obviously being influenced by something else. And it was following the prescriptive prescriptivism conference that Ingrid organized in Leiden. Um, and in turn, when I organized uh, a conference on norms and margins in X, that I began to come into contact with colleagues who um, very helpfully uh, led me in the direction of style and usage guides. And I realized that some of these changes then uh, could be explained by normative linguistics. Um, the choice of which or that in a restrictive relative clause is a well-known topic in style and usage guides. Um, and the well-known uh, quotation from Strunk and White uh, that careful writers should go witch hunting. Uh, so this uh, obviously revealed that someone somewhere in the publication process had decided to follow style and usage guides to the letter. I suspected this ha was happening at the copy editing level. Uh, it was confirmed by my own personal experience. And so I carried out a number of surveys online with American uh, and UK um, copy editors, asking them to choose their preferences for sentences that I took from a number of works, uh, children's literature, travelogues, etc. And it became clear that copy editors were, in general, driven by a desire for clarity, consistency, and concision, values that were also to be found in style and usage guides, such as the Chicago Manual Style, Merriam-Webster's Collegiate Dictionary, Garner's Modern American Usage, etc. And these values meant that certain grammatical structures were being considered to be too wordy, for example, uh, the passive voice, the intensifiers such as kind of, very, really. And of course, that existential there, there is, there are, uh, frequently came under fire as being meaningless clutter. Um, obviously, if you can, if you have, there is a man standing outside, it's shorter to say a man is standing outside. Um, and so the possibility of having two editions of a work published in two different parts of the English speaking world, uh, brought to light these normative practices that for the general reader would have remained hidden. And this led me to wonder what changes might also have been made to UK texts by copy editors pre-publication. 
Uh, in 2019, uh, just before COVID, uh, I was lucky enough to receive a grant to study for a month at the Harry Ransom Center um, at the University of Texas at Austin. And as you may know, this center houses more than 42 million manuscripts. So I was able to study not only the correspondence between an author and their copy editor, but also the suggestive changes made to the author's manuscript by the copy editor and also the editor. And one of the authors that I looked at was Kazuo Ishiguro, uh, and in particular, the novel, The Remains of the Day. Uh, in this novel, um, the, um, the main protagonist, uh, who, who is also the narrator, Stevens, is presented as being very formal, uh, rather stuffy, and these traits of character uh, enable him to hide his emotions, but they're also reflected in what I've labeled in another analysis as his mind style the way he expresses himself linguistically, the use of certain grammatical structures. Now, a closer reading, uh, a, a close study of the corrected manuscripts uh, revealed that the voice of this character had in fact been reinforced by the copy editor's suggestions. For example, the avoidance of preposition stranding, again, um, something we find very much in style and usage guides. Preposition stranding um, occurs when a clause is introduced by a relative pronoun and ends in a preposition. The alternative being the um, structure known as pied piping when the preposition precedes the relative pronoun. So what we noticed was, uh, what I noticed was that the um, copy editor had actually corrected or suggested corrections to uh, Ishiguro uh, regarding the preposition stranding that he had in his original manuscript. Similarly, uh, the copy editor had also um, suggested removing any split infinitives that occurred in the manuscript. Now, as I say, both these features, um, so both these um, structures, split infinitives and preposition stranding, feature heavily in style and usage guides down the ages, even if both are considered to be acceptable today. My research revealed that copy editors did not all react in the same way to a specific grammatical structure nor did they always appear to be systematic in their corrections. And there were different kinds of prescriptivism uh, and normative uh, linguistics at work, thus supporting Anne Curzon's premise that prescriptivism is an umbrella term. And so this made it very difficult to establish a firm pattern. But what I think is important and what I would like to underline is that these changes obviously remain invisible to the reader as they take place before publication. In other words, the imposition of the norm remains hidden. Um, and the role of copy editors in imposing a linguistic norm is one field which I think uh, merits further investigation. Perhaps closely working with copy editors might be one way of investigating this further. But I would also like to argue that normative linguistics is in fact a pervading ideology that touches all our everyday lives. There have been some very important fields uh, being researched from this aspect, uh, notably in education policies. And I'm thinking in particular of a colleague, uh, Dr. Ian Cushing, who gave a keynote at the conference I organized um, that Ingrid mentioned in X last summer, but has also published in the Routledge Handbook of Prescriptivism that Marana uh, co-edited and she mentioned also earlier. And he underlines how schools play a fundamental role in maintaining white middle-class values and normative language practices. The UK curriculum since 2013 has placed a greater emphasis on teaching clause level grammar and standardized English. So in many ways, education policies are reflecting a normative culture and reflecting this imposition of linguistic norms. Um, as Moana suggested, uh, a future field of research could well be then uh, looking um, at the intersection with social justice and thinking about education uh, further. Um, but there's also the pervasion of norm normative linguistics in the media. Um, and this is where all too often vari varieties other than the standard are presented as being either undesirable or laughable. There are abundant examples on film and in television series. I know Ingrid has a number of examples of this. And Professor Jane Hodgson, for example, has drawn attention to Sherlock Holmes's grammar lesson 
uh, in episode three, series one of the BBC series Sherlock, which you can access easily online. Um, examples are by two, though, in novels, um, one of which concerns the who, whom rule, but as in the example here, it's not just that, it's also regarding preposition stranding. They both come together. Um, so this is one of several examples of metalinguistic discourse in the media. People, characters telling other characters how to speak or write. Um, another example in Richard Osman's recent uh, detective story, The Man Who Died Twice. Um, in this particular instance, we have a character, Elizabeth, who at one point is compared to the sort of teacher who terrifies you all year, end of quote. It has to be said that the characters then, um, in these examples I've given you, are uh, both educated or a high social class or a little pedantic. But I would also say that beyond using um, such normative linguistics for characterization, um, these kind of conversations are perpetuating the notion of correct, incorrect. Um, they're also influencing the viewer or reader and their perceptions of the norm. And they also play into people's linguistic insecurity. Interestingly, in the examples I've quoted here from the media, the corrections are being made to spoken language, not written language, which is where the norm is usually imposed. So if we're looking at further ways to explore normative linguistics in the future, I think the social role of normative linguistics is one possible avenue to follow. Um, and also to think carefully about the hidden um, uh, use of normative linguistics too. One of the challenges will be to establish larger corpora, large scale comparative studies, and to include other languages or to compare with other languages and to uncover then those invisible aspects of normative linguistics. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Linda. I think I should stop uh, recording first.